Again, if you have your Bibles this morning, be finding Ephesians chapter 3. We've been asking questions, asking for a friend. And one of those questions is, and sometimes you may have this approach to you, someone will ask you, how do I know God loves me? I mean, and that, that's really a legitimate question to ask, especially when you see all the things that are going on around the world, when you see man's inhumanity to man, and when you see all the bad things that happen, you say, well, if God loved me, these things wouldn't happen. And bad things that happen to people, you know, cancer and divorces and broken relationships and all these different things. And so people ask that question, how do I know God loves me with all the bad things that are going on in the world? Well, that's what we're going to answer this morning. We're going to look at that. I want to ask you, first of all, though, what do you wish for? Some would say, well, you know, I'd, I, I, I wish that uh, the weather would be just perfect, 70 degrees year round. I, someone would say, well, you know, I wish all my bills were paid. Another would say, I wish my taxes were done. Well, you're too late. It's already passed, but you can get an extension. I know. Just trust me. Uh, you know, another would say, you know, I, I wish I got a new job or I wish I get get married or I wish I could get out of the one that I'm in or, you know, I, I wish the pain would stop. But if you were to ask the Apostle Paul, what was his favorite wish? He would say this, I want to know Christ. That's my greatest wish. Why would anybody say that? Because he obviously knew something that most people don't know. Most of your problems in life come from not understanding, I believe, not understanding how much God loves you. It causes worry, it causes shame, it causes fear, it causes guilt, it causes insecurity. You need to know that God really does love you. Now, how do I know for sure? I had intended this morning to give you six proofs of God's love that you, but I'm going to summarize the whole thing in case you don't catch it. I'm going to summarize the whole thing in one sentence. God loves you more than you will ever know. He loves you more than you'll ever know. But we're going to answer that question a little bit. How do I know God loves me? I know God loves me because, number one, I know God loves me because he made me. You know, Psalm 145 verse 17 says, says, the Lord is loving towards all that he made. Circle all. God made you to love you and God doesn't play any favorites. He loves you. God has never made a person that he didn't love. He made you so he could love you. Psalm 103 verses 13 and 14 say this. God is like a father to us, tender and sympathetic. He knows we are but dust. Circle father. It doesn't say that God is a judge or a policeman or a drill sergeant, a boss. It says that God is a perfect father. He cares about you. Now, we were created to be I guess the best way to sum it up is in a family relationship. Not a religion, but a relationship. A relationship with God and a relationship with those around us. Now, you know, the Bible says you can sum up the whole Bible in one word. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's loving God and loving your neighbor. Loving the people around you. How many of you really thought before you had kids that your kids were going to be perfect? I found a poem I, I printed this morning before things says, No child of mine. It said, No child of mine I used to cry before the stork had fluttered by will ever throw a temper fit or bite or scratch or whine or hit or wear a diaper till he's three or sit for hours and watch TV or dawdle so he makes me late or leave his spinach on the plate or act and sort like other kids who've made their parents flip their lids. But with the pitter-patter of baby's feet are 40 million words to eat. You know, some of us think, when you know, my kids, oh, when I have kids, they're not going to be like all these other kids. My kids are going to do right. Oh, they just don't, you know, they let these kids go and they do all these things. I, I saw a sign going into town that says, you know, there are perfect parents. They just hadn't had, they just hadn't had kids yet. You know, that, you know that's kind of the way it is. You know, we, we get these kids and sometimes we get this idea that, you know, our kids are going to be perfect. Well, rude awakening. But let me tell you this, 
When God created you, he already knew every sin you'd commit. He already knew every stupid decision that you would make. He already knew every dumb thing that you would do, every hurtful thing, every hateful thing. And he still loves you. You know, we make kids as parents because we love them. Kids are messy. Babies burp and mess their pants. They drool and they break things. They, uh, you know, when they get older, they, they take our money. They use our cars. They smash our cars. They get in trouble. But we still love them. Now, what is that? Are we crazy? No. We're parents. And God put in us the capacity to love. And when you have love, you want to create something to love. God, the Bible says, is love. Now, it doesn't say love is God, but the Bible says God is love. You know, there's a difference. They're not the same. It's like, you know, there's a difference between saying, you know, that dog is a girl and saying that girl's a dog. You know, there's a difference in the way you say it. God is love, but God is not, or love is not God. The Bible says that you are made to be loved by God. How do we know that God loves us? Because he made us. God knew every stupid thing that we're going to do in advance, and he, he still said, I'm going to make them because I love them. You were made as an object of God's love. God was so full of love, he said, I'm going to create people that I can have a relationship with. I know God loves me because he made me. But not only that, I know God loves me because he notices every details of my life. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 30, think of this. It says, God knows every, how many hairs on your head? Now, some of you look at the back of mine, you say, well, he, you know, he, he doesn't have to keep up with so much anymore. But I, I have a theory. John, we don't lose our hair. We don't. I think, you know, I, I come up with this theory, we don't lose it, it just moves. You know, I'll look in the mirror and all of a sudden there's this hair coming to my nose and I think, how did, where did that come from? I'll look and there's a, this, you know, two inch hair sticking out my ear. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, I don't lose it, it just moves, it goes to different places, gets on your back, it goes to other different places. I don't want to talk about that, give you images that you don't want this morning. But God knows every one of them. He knows what's coming and going. He knows everything about me. And he loves you completely. And he's interested in every part. You know, I used to think that God was only interested in me when I went to church and, and when I studied my Bible and when I did some, you know, spiritual things. No, God is intimately interested in every detail of your life. He's interested when you're happy. He's interested when you're sad. He's interested when you make a sale. He's interested when you didn't make that sale. He's interested when you succeed, and he's interested when you don't succeed. He's interested when you're down, depressed, discouraged. He's interested in your hobbies and what you're interested in. Why? Because of what I said earlier. He made you. And as a parent, I'm intensely interested in my kids. I'm interested in the details of their lives. When, you, when you're interested in details, it shows you love. Why is it important to notice details? Because if you care, you'll be aware. We know that. God is always aware of every detail of your life. Every. Why? Because he always cares about every detail of your life. He made you. He notices every care. He notices every detail. Some of you are going through some, maybe some tough things right now. Whatever that tough time is, no matter what you're going through, God is already aware of it. He cares about your financial problems, your sexual problems, your physical problems, your mental problems, your social problems, your, 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 your problems at work, your problems in your marriage, your problems at school. He cares and he's aware because he loves you. And I want you to take this home. Put it on your refrigerator. And when you get discouraged, when you're having a tough day and you're stressed out, remember, God loves you. But not only that, he loves you. I know that he loves me because he gave me the capacity for pleasure. God gave you a set of eyes when he made you. And then he filled the world with all kinds of colors. Now, he, he evidently loves some of y'all better than he loves me because I'm colorblind. But I, I can still see some colors. But he put all these different things in the world. 
Why? Just for your pleasure. Now, what's the purpose of color? Pleasure. Some are pleasing, some are not. I mean, God could have made the whole world look like Moscow in the wintertime, gray and no color, gray and drab and ugly. But instead, he made this beautiful world with canyons and vistas and sunrises and sunsets and beautiful waterfalls and all these different things. He did these things. What's the purpose for all that? God created it for your pleasure. He loves you. And he created it for your pleasure. And he created you with the capacity for pleasure. God gave you a, a pair of ears so that you can hear all the wonderful sounds that are in the world. You can hear music. You can hear all these different things. You can hear a baby cry. We, you know, I mean, it's all these different things. He could have made everything one sound, or he could have, you know, or, or you could have heard just one sound like some animals do. You know, some animals don't hardly hear anything. They just hear certain frequencies, but very few. But why did he do that? Because he wanted you to experience pleasure. God even created in you taste buds. Filled the world with flavors like chocolate ice cream and cinnamon rolls and salsa and barbecue sauce and home, you know, again, homemade ice cream and cake and all these different things. Why? I mean, God could have made us like a car where, you know, we just run on certain fuel and that's all it is. You put the fuel in because that's all food is, isn't it? It's a fuel. But no, he didn't just put that. He put taste buds in us so we could experience things and, and enjoy things and, and love things. and did it. He, he, I mean, he, he could have done it. He could have said, you know what? I'm going to make man run off oatmeal. And that's all you ate. But he didn't. He created you with taste buds, and then he gave you all these flavors. Why? Just because he enjoys seeing you enjoy life. He loves you. Then the next thing, in 1 Timothy, says, God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Circle the word enjoyment. Think about that. He provides us everything. Why? For your enjoyment. That verse explodes one of the greatest myths about Christianity. I mean, I probably have heard a thousand times from people, when you talk to them about becoming a Christian, they say, well, you know, if, if I commit my life to Jesus Christ, I'm going to be miserable. I, I won't have any fun anymore. You know, I won't be able to go out and do the things that I want to do. You know, I'm going to be boring, boring if I live for God. The fact is, the world has sold you a lie. Be honest. Which sounds like more fun, Miller time or Sunday school? Satan had told us a lie that, you know, to be, you know, to, to, to be good means to be miserable. That's kind of what he t he's told us. To be bad means having fun. To go to church, except when you come here and hear me, means boring. You know, but, you know, you know but that, that's, what the, that's what they tell you. You know, yesterday I was reading a re recent issue in, in, in Newsweek, and there was this two-page ad for a Chevy Cavalier. Some time ago I read this article, and, and it, the title of it said, It's Quiet as a, ch as a Church. Well, that copyright obviously didn't go to Linary. I mean, with all the kids we have running around here. But most people are, are looking for fun in all the wrong places. I consider the most miserable place in the world, if you think about it, is a single bar. All these people pretending that they're happy, and they're miserable. Where else in society do you walk up to a total stranger and offer to buy them something? Hey, could I buy you a drink? Now suppose you're in Sears. Hey, could I buy you a toaster? That never happens. <laughs> could I buy you a refrigerator? You know, it never happens. I don't know what fun was. I didn't know what fun was until I discovered the reason that God made me and began living that plan that he had for me and since then, my life has been more enjoyable. The Bible says when you get into God's plan for your life, life makes sense. Then you stop looking for cheap thrills to turn your own. You know, I take all the drugs that I want. I get drunk all that I want to get drunk. I mess around immorally 
all that I want to mess around. I lie and cheat all that I want to. When I became a Christian, though, the thing is, Jesus changed my want to. See the difference? I don't want to do those things. They're cheap thrills. They're plastic, artificial sweeteners that don't last. Jesus spoke more about happiness than he did about heaven. He loves me so that he created me with the capacity for pleasure. Isn't that awesome? I know he loves me because the good plans that he has for my life. God always wants the best for my life. As a matter of fact, he tells me in Jeremiah 29, in verse 11, he says, I have good plans for you, not plans to hurt you. I will give you hope and a good future. God knows what will make you happy more than you know what will make you happy. He ought to know. I mean, he's the creator. Check out the owner's manual. He knows what makes you happy. The problem is what we think will make us happy is often different than what God knows will make us happy. And we foolishly follow our own instincts rather than what God says. And we get into all kinds of problems like worry and guilt and fear and bitterness and resentment and depression and discouragement and insecurity and all those different things. Why? Because we get outside of God's plan. Trust him. He has a good plan for your life. That's what he says. You matter to God. You matter to God and he made you for a purpose. Even a thousand years ago, he knew you'd be sitting here on May the 7th, 2023, just to get your attention so that he could say to you, guess what? I love you. Hey, you matter to me. You really do. He knew you were going to be here today and he wanted you to hear that. It isn't just by accident. I have a plan and a purpose, and you've been missing it, and then you wonder why things don't work out. You're not following the way I made you to follow. He has a good plan for your life. You were not created by accident. In John 10, 10 and 11, Jesus said, I came to give life, life in all its fullness. I am the good shepherd. And then he goes on to say, how he's, he takes care of us. Jesus didn't come to give religion. He came to give a relationship to God so that you could know God, so that you could know the, how that God is and how that he created you, how that he loves you, how he cares for you, how he does all these things for you. That's what w we celebrate when we come to worship. God came to earth in the form of a human being and he gave himself for you so that you could get to know God, so that you could have that relationship with God. Until you follow God's plan, you're not living. You're just existing. You get up in the morning, you go to work, you come home, you go to bed, you watch TV in the evening, go to some parties on the weekends, and, and you think you're living, you're not. You're just existing. You're not living until you know God's plan for your life. Then I know God loves me because he sent Christ to die for me. This is the ultimate proof of God's love. That's why we take the Lord's Supper. We just took the Lord's Supper a few minutes ago. We took the Lord's Supper to remember what God has done and what he will do. And, and God is, has a purpose and a plan. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, he tells us, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us, it says. He cares about us. The ultimate proof... I didn't know how many people you know who would die for you, but I don't know how many people who would die for me, but the Bible says that even while we were even, we didn't even know God, while we rejected God, God sent his son to pay the penalty. All the things I've ever done wrong, God says, they've already been paid for. When you go to heaven and you stand before God, and he says, why should I let you in? You either have to say, well, you know what? I paid for all my sins. All my sins are taken care of. And, and I, I've paid for that, which you don't ever have enough credit to do that. Or you say, I've, I accepted what Jesus did for my sins. I accepted his, his payment. That's plan B. You don't stand a chance on plan A, doing it yourself. 
It says Christ came to die for our sins. If you've ever asked Jesus Christ, how much do you love me? He'd say, oh, I love you this much. And he spread his hands on the cross and, and he died for us. That's the ultimate expression of God's love. And that's what it's all about. And then finally, I know that God loves me because he, forgi he forgives me when I ask. I've discovered that the number one reason that people don't know God is guilt. They're guilt. They feel guilty. You remember when you were in school and you didn't know people, you didn't want to get around people that you thought didn't like you. You just didn't want to be around those people. You didn't hang out with those people. So you stay away from those kind of people. A lot of people stay away from God because they think God doesn't like them because they know that they're guilty. And God says, listen, I'll forgive you. Maybe you felt, I can't have a relationship with God because all the things that I've done wrong in my life, and I don't know that God can forgive me for all those things, you're wrong. Maybe you thought, I could never be forgiven. You are wrong. The Bible does teach that, yes, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all need to be made right with God by what it says, by his grace, which is a free gift. They need to be made free from sin through Christ Jesus. So, yes, we've all sinned. I, I never met anybody who was perfect. I don't know anybody who would say they're perfect, that are in the right mind. I don't measure up even to my own standards, let alone God's standards. I don't, you know, I, I don't have any problems with the first part. I've blown it. All have sinned. I've made mistakes. All have sinned. I've sinned, and so, and so have you. Yet now God declares us not guilty if we trust in Jesus Christ who freely takes away our sins. What's been keeping you from a closer relationship with God? You know, some of you were close to God in the past and you've drifted away. You were close, but maybe you've, maybe you've forgotten. Or maybe you think, well, you know what? I tried and I didn't do so good. I, matter of fact, I, I've been talking to some, of our, some, some people about, you know, their need to, to obey the gospel. One of the things that I get a lot of times when I deal with people who are thinking about obeying the gospel, a lot of young people, not only young people. I had a 70-year-old man that was this way. I talked to him, and, 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 and their thing was, well, I don't know if I could do it. Number one, you can't. He never said you could. He can. He always said he would. Why don't you let him? But, but the thing is, you know, they say, oh, I don't know if I can stay the way I need to be. Well, you know, that's, you'll never be a Christian until you become a Christian. But I'm saying, you're going to fail. You're going to mess up. And then there's people who think, well, you know, I messed up. I didn't do what I need to do. I sinned. I fell back in some sin. And they fall away from God because they don't think that God can love them because of the mistakes they've made. With all the things I've done wrong, what's God going to say to me? Well, in Isaiah 54 and 7, with a deep compassion, I will bring you back. Jesus told a story of the prodigal son. You remember that? A man had a son who blew it, took all his dad's earnings and left. The father loved him when he was at home. The father loved him when he left. The father loved him when he blew it all. All his whole life savings went out and did bad things, spent his inheritance. The father loved him when he came back home. You know, the only verse in the Bible that talks about it, it's an illustration of God. The only verse in the Bible you ever see God running is when the prodigal comes home. Isn't that interesting? And why is he running? He's running to because he's so glad to get him back. He never, he's never loved you any more than he does right now, and he'll never love you any more, any less than what he loves you right now. He never loves you any more than he does right now, and he'll never love you any less than he does right now. He loves you, and that love is not based on performance. It's based on the fact that, that God is love. Coming back home, he says again, with a deep love, I will bring you back. I have a plan. I have a purpose. I have a goal for your life. If I had a wish for you for the rest of this year, it would be that you would understand how much God loves you. Again, the verse that I mentioned in the beginning, Ephesians chapter 3, 17 through 19, I pray that you... And all God's holy people would have the power to understand the greatness of God's love. 
What a great prayer. I think if we can understand that one thing, I, I pray, this is Paul talking, that you and all of God's holy people will have the power to understand the greatness of Christ's love, how wide and how long, and then he goes on, and how deep that love is. Christ's love is greater than anyone can ever know. But I pray that you will be able to know that love. Circle four words that describes God's love. How long, how wide, how deep, how high his love really is. What does that mean? It means God's love is wide enough to include everybody. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. God loves you. It's long enough to last forever. The problem with human love is it doesn't. It runs out. That's why you have so many divorces today. Human love can dry up. God's love, he says, is what? It's high enough to be everywhere. You'll never go anywhere that God doesn't go with you. You'll never be separated from his love if you accept it. And it's deep enough to meet your needs. When you're in deep despair, God's love is deeper. Some of you are in the pits right now. You're in a financial pit. Some of you are in an emotional pit. Uh, you're in a relational pit. Some of you are waiting for test results to come back. Some of you are scared to death. You're, you're going to go bankrupt. Some of you are fighting for your home right now. You need God's love through Christ in your life. He can make the difference. Four dimensions, high, wide, long, deep, are the four dimensions of the cross. That's why God's love is what it's all about. The ultimate expression of God's love is the cross. If you'll go home this afternoon and you say, to, you know, if I were to go home and say to my wife, you know, I love you, I, I love you with all my heart. And I, I, want you, I, I want you to know everything that I can do to make your life pleasant and happy and fulfilled. I love you more than anything in the world and I'll do whatever it takes. Wouldn't you think that'd be weird if, if your wife would say, oh, really? Well, that's nice. Excuse me, I'm watching TV. Would you get out in front of the TV? I'm trying to watch this show. Wouldn't it be crazy? But a lot of people treat God's love that way, don't they? They come to church and they hear, oh, you matter to God. Oh, you matter to God. God loves you. He cares about you. He has a plan for your life. And they walk and, and, they, go, and they go out of here and they say, well, that's really nice. Really. Sorry, but I've got my own plans. And they will miss the very reason that they were made for. Don't do it. How do I establish a relationship with God? Well, all of us came here for different reasons. Some of you came because it's a thing to do. It's just what you do. You go to church. That's what you've been raised to do. You go to church. You came because you, you, you come all the time. Some of you came because somebody invited you. I don't care why you think you came this morning. You are not here by accident. Years before you were ever born, God knew that you would be here, sitting right here this morning, and, and, and he, could get to, he wanted to get your attention and tell you, I love you. I sent my son, Jesus Christ, for you. I have a plan for you. If you'll just let me in your life and be the director, things are going to be so much more better in your life. They're going to be so much, make more, so much more sense in your life. The God saying, I want to have a relationship with you, not a religion. And if you're willing to do that, you can make that decision right now. Obey the gospel right now. Believe, turn from your sins, confess your faith, be baptized, have your sins washed away. Start that relationship with God. How do I know that God loves me? Look at all he's done. He wants that relationship. But if we could help you this morning, I want to encourage you. As we stand, we offer the invitation.